Uh, Billy, our friend, has a 600 SEL Mercedes. Now, I, I don't even know if we have cars that big or that fast here in Canada or in the United States. We cruise down the Audubon at 240 kilometers per hour. You know, there's no speed limits in most places on the Audubon. And I just love fast cars, so I was really thoroughly enjoying this. And later, we were sitting in Billy's living room uh, with the marble floors and his elegant tables, and businessman Billy began talking about the current state of affairs in Germany, the political, the economic, the social uh, situation in Germany. Now, Billy is not a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, far from it. In fact, when he saw my husband and I bow our heads and say a blessing over our food before we ate, he just laughed and he said, oh, I call in the priest once a year to bless the food, and I mean, bless the whole house, and that way I don't have to bother with praying for the whole year. But Vili, secular, materialist Vili, became the stones crying out that day. He, he leaned forward to me and he said to me in German so earnestly, he said, Cindy, something is about to happen to our world. And I thought to myself, yeah, of course. <laughs> something is about to happen to our world. Jesus is about to come. And on this eve of the greatest crisis the world has ever seen are you praying for your family are you praying for your friends continually earnestly in faith that God is hearing regardless of what you are seeing so how does Jesus encourage us to be constant in prayer always in prayer so the, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. They will not toil in vain or bear children doomed to misfortune, for they will be a people blessed by the Lord, they and their descendants with them. Before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Isaiah 65, 23. This is the confidence that we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, and we know it's his will that our children be saved, right? So we don't have to add even the caveat for this one. Um, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask... We know that we have what we have asked of him. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. And I'll tell you, I'll be honest with you, this kind of confidence is hard for me sometimes. But what's helping me is to praise God for the littlest evidence that he is at work in the lives of my family and friends. Remember that after Elijah saw that, that little cloud on the horizon of a totally blue sky, he ran quickly to tell Ahab, hurry down the mountain, a deluge is coming. And that's how I want to be when I see the smallest breakthrough. I want to praise Jesus for it. And in the process of thanking and praising Jesus, my own faith increases. Faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. I, I want us to remember that faith is being sure of what we hope for, and it's the, to be certain of what we do not see. That's what I really want to emphasize right now. It's to be certain of what we do not see. So if your heart is broken over the choices that some of your family and your family members are making, um, this one brings me comfort. In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. That's Jonah 2.2. 2. The times in which we live are not ordinary. They're not ordinary at all. Ellen White writes, moral darkness, like a funeral pal, covers the earth. All man manner of false doctrines, heresies, satanic deceptions are mislighting the minds of men. Without the spirit and power of God, 
it will be in vain that we labor to present the truth. We must have the Holy Spirit of God to sustain us in the conflict, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's, you know, that's why you know, th th we can't just do this half-heartedly. If we're wrestling against the devil himself, we gotta be pretty earnest about this. Isaiah chapter 59 verse 16 says that God himself is amazed that there was no intercessor. No one praying for others in times like this. I, I think if we could see the conflict between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels over the souls of our dear ones, we would just not cease to pray for the spirit of God to intervene. Certainly we should be praying for our family and friends, right? And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. But who else should we be praying for? Surely, we should be praying more and doing less criticizing of the leaders of our local and global church. Are we hoping to see the whole church revived? That time will never come. There are persons in the church who are not converted and who will not unite in earnest, prevailing prayer. We have to enter upon the work individually. We must pray more and talk less. Don't you love that? That's why I try to get done in these sessions a little bit early so that we can pray more and talk less. Uh, that, that's from volume one of the Selected Messages, page 122. So who else can we pray for in these last days? Certainly our governments, the leaders of our nations, because Paul says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior. 1 Timothy, 1, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. So we've got to wrap our minds about that, don't you think, brothers and sisters? We're a little bit reluctant sometimes, particularly if we don't support the leaders of our local church or our municipality or province or, or nation even. We, we have to say, really? I got to pray for him? But what did that say? This is good and pleases God our Savior. We can also play, pray an intercessory prayer for the salvation of our families, for our children, our spouses, our grandchildren, the youth of our church. But before we return to this topic of intercessory prayer, let's just talk a bit about how we should pray. Do you have this book? It's just terrific. It's helped me to know so much more about how to pray. Have you seen that book? you have it? It's over there in the ABC in that same place that I was telling you about. Um, there's just so much in it. We're just going to take a few things from these four chapters that are listed up there on the screen. We're going to just take a few things from that book today before we get back to intercessory prayer. I don't want you to ever say that Ellen White didn't have a sense of humor. She wrote, there are some, I fear, who do not take their troubles to God in private prayer but reserve them for the prayer meeting and there catch up on their praying for several days. Such may be named prayer meeting killers. Their cold, frozen prayers and long, backslidden testimonies cast a shadow. That's from Testimonies, Volume 2, 578. She writes, The prayer of faith is never lost, but to claim that it will always be answered in the same way and for the particular thing that we have expected is presumption. So we don't know exactly how God is gonna answer our prayer. We don't dictate to him how to answer it, just the general heart cry. Do our prayers need to be oratorical masterpieces? Ellen White writes, all the flowery words at our command are not equivalent to one holy desire. 
That's from Thoughts of the Mounts of Blessing, page 86. And then she goes on and says, Prayer is no evidence of conversion if the life is not changed. Messages, messages to young people, 71. So as part of Satan's counterfeit answers to prayer, we're also going to see miracles. So the persons will claim to be healed in the name of God, but because they reject the law of God, which is this character, that healing comes from Satan, exactly. Ellen White writes, we need not be deceived. Wonderful scenes with which Satan will be closely connected will soon take place. God's word declares that Satan will work miracles. He will make people sick, and then he will suddenly remove from them his satanic power. They will then be regarded as healed. And then she says something incredible. These works of apparent healing will bring Seventh-day Adventists to the test. Many who've had great light will fail to walk in the light because they have not become one with Christ. But prayer is not just to discern true from false, error from genuine miracles or counterfeit miracles. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Our early Adventist pioneers got that. They knew how to really open their hearts to God. When the message of truth was first proclaimed, how often we prayed. How often was the voice of intercession heard? Frequently we spent hours in earnest prayer, two or three together, claiming the promise. Often the sound of weeping was heard, and then the voice of thanksgiving and the song of praise. Our pioneers learned that prayer is the key in the hand of faith to unlock heaven's storehouse, where are treasured the boundless resources of omnipotence. And this is my very favorite Ellen White passage on prayer. It might be your very favorite too. Keep your wants, your joys, your sorrows, your cares, and your fears before God. You cannot burden him. You cannot weary him. He who numbers the hairs of your head is not indifferent to the wants of his children. The Lord is very pitying and of tender mercy. His heart of love is touched by our sorrows and even by our utterances of them. Take to him everything that perplexes the mind. Nothing is too great for him to bear, for he holds up worlds. He rules over all the affairs of the universe. Nothing that in any way concerns our peace is too small for him to notice. No anxiety can befall us. No trial come that he takes no notice of, no immediate interest, because the relations between God and each soul are as distinct and full as though there were not another soul for whom he gave his beloved son. That Steps to Christ, page 100, such an incredible passage. Ellen White writes in Councils on Diets and Foods, page 52, if the Savior with his divine strength, felt the need of prayer, how much more should mortals feel the necessity of constant, fervent prayer? When Christ was the most fiercely beset by temptation, he ate nothing. He committed himself to God, and through earnest prayer and perfect submission to the will of his Father, he came off conqueror. So, Fasting is almost a forgotten discipline today. When I was a kid, we used to, the, the whole church, the whole global church used to fast every quarter. And my mom let me do it even when I was, you know, pretty young. It was my choice. Um, and she said, yeah, I figure it won't hurt you to go a day without food. But fasting doesn't necessarily mean eating nothing. Some people fast from desserts or from sugar for a time or they fast from all social media for a time. One young woman that I know that just really coveted guidance from God ate only dry toast and raisins for 30 days. Not to earn favor with God, no, no, no way. She fasted because she was serious 
about seeking God with all of her heart, all of her mind, all of her soul, and her body. She wanted a clear mind so she could hear the voice of God because she really needed help in making a decision. Again, in Councils to Diet, on Diets and Foods, page 52, it says, those living in the last days especially need to pray. So why do those of us that are living in the last days especially need to pray? Because of deception, certainly, but also because it is the time of the latter rain when the Lord will give largely of his spirit. That was in the Review and Herald on March 2, 1897. We talked yesterday about the latter rain and the conditions of receiving it and its importance in our witness. In order for our intercessory prayers, our prayers that we're praying for other people to be saved in God's kingdom and accept Jesus, we ourselves need to be completely filled up, filled up with the Holy Spirit. By God's grace, under his instruction, we can remove from the door of our hearts anything that prevents that Holy Spirit from occupying our minds and hearts. And then when God is ready, and we don't know the day or the hour, but when he's ready to pour out that latter rain, we're going to be prepared to receive it. And as we engage in intercessory prayer for our children, for our spouses, for our families, our grandchildren, the youth of our church, we don't need to do it alone. So let's talk a little bit more about intercessory prayer. What can we learn about praying in the last days, especially for those that are close to our hearts? You know, how often have our hearts been kind of encouraged when somebody says to us, uh, I'll be praying for you. And how easy is it to say those words with every good intention, right? And then uh, go our way and forget our promise. Ellen White was a woman of prayer. In her early Christian experience, she reported long seasons of prayer, laboring for, pleading for the souls of her young friends, some of whom were careless and flippant. But she kept on praying until every one of her young friends was converted. So based on her own experience and the light that God gave, she often encouraged Christians to pray for each other. She says, why do you not two or three meet together and plead with God for the salvation of some special one? And then still another, second volume of, seventh volume of the Testimonies, page 21. She says, let's pray for one another, bringing one another right into the presence of God by living faith. That's in Review and Herald on August 28, 1888. Has, had any, have any of you today had someone say to you, I'm going to be praying for you today? Anybody? One person, two persons, three persons. I, I wish that we could all say it, don't you? That somebody would have said to us today, by text maybe, by phone, in person, I'm going to be praying for you today. It's just such a comfort uh, for us to know that someone is bringing us right into the presence of God by living faith. Prayerful, faithful, earnest prayer will... Move the arm that moves the world. Faithful, earnest prayer will move the arm that moves the world. Wow, really? You know, sometimes we think, I didn't know I had that kind of power. Well, we don't have that kind of power, but Jesus does. And in his providence, he's chosen to use that power in response to our prayer of faith. All has to do with this great controversy thing, you know where Jesus' hands are sometimes bound by the person or the being who is claimed to be prince of this world until we free those mighty arms of power by asking for intervention. God wants us to pray for specific persons, for neighbors, for friends. Begin to pray for souls. Come near to Christ. Come to his bleeding side. Let a meek and quiet spirit adorn your lives. And let your earnest, broken, humble petitions ascend to him for wisdom that you may have success in saving not only your own soul, but the souls of others. Testimonies, Volume 1, 513. I wonder sometimes if our prayers for others are just a little bit tame and spiritless, or are they prayers of real earnestness? Do, do we even know how to pray prayers of real earnestness? I'm asking the question of myself, too. Souls are to be sought for, prayed for, labored for. Earnest petitions are to be made. 
Fervent prayers are to be offered. Our team, spiritless petitions, are to be changed into petitions of intense earnestness. And I love the optimism of this statement. Be always kind and courteous, cheerful and hopeful. Keep praying. Keep working for souls. That's Manuscript Releases, Volume 6, 379. So, of course, I hope we are praying for our neighbors by name, for opportunities to help them, uh, and to also maybe say a word speaking well of God to them. But who is closest to our hearts? For many of us, our children are closest to our hearts, right? We should pray to God much more than we do. There's great strength and blessing in praying together in our families with and for our children. Have you ever wept over your children's spiritual journey? Ah, here, I see a few heads nodding. Those who sow in tears shall reap in joy, Psalms 126, 5. And here's another precious promise for parents. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will gather you and your children from east and west and from north and south. I will bring my sons and daughters back to Israel from the distant corners of the earth, Isaiah 45, 5 and 6. But now the Lord says, do not weep any longer, for I will reward you. Your children will come back to you from the distant land of the enemy, Jeremiah 31, 16. The distant land of the enemy is a symbol of our children who are in Satan's playgrounds. Far from the safety of the kingdom of grace. And this promise is for them. And you know, this, this picture actually illustrates the joy of, a, of parents who lost their child in death. And so this is the resurrection. But I think there's another application to this. And that is... The joy that we have when we receive our children back from spiritual death, right? Here's another beautiful promise. Look and see, for all your children will come back to you. As surely as I live, says the Lord, they will be like jewels or bridal ornaments for you to display. For I will fight those who fight you and I will save your children. You know, we're concerned about the influences of our children, right? So these are those who fight us. Uh, the media, social media, friends who have rejected spirituality. Um, all kinds of temptations that Satan throws in the, in the face of our children and our grandchildren. So here Jesus says, I will fight those who fight you and I will save your children. Isaiah 49, 18 and 25. So I see a few people that are almost, not quite, but almost as old as I am. Let me ask you a question. Uh, do we quit praying for our children when they turn 18? <laughs> there you go, right on. If parents would feel that they are never released from their burden of educating and training their children for God, if they would do their work in faith, cooperating with God by earnest prayer and work, they would be successful in bringing their children to the Savior. Isn't that beautiful? Oh, I, I have to read that by faith sometimes. That's Signs of the Times, April 9, 1896. Let Christ find you his helping hand to carry out his purposes. By prayer, you may gain an experience that will make your ministry for your children a what? Perfect success that will make your ministry for your children a perfect success child guidance page 69 the spirit loves to address the children isn't that a wonderful promise the spirit the holy spirit of god loves to speak to the children and discover to them the treasures and beauties of the word which will be as a barricade against the temptations of the enemy the sparks of heavenly love will fall upon the hearts of the children. My life today, 44. How about this one, Child Guidance 256? After you have done your duty faithfully to your children, 
Then carry them to God and ask him to help you. Tell him that you have done your part. And then in faith, ask God to do his part, that which you cannot do. Child Guidance 256. God is pleased with the faith that takes him at his word. The mother of Augustine prayed for her son's conversion. She saw no evidence that the Spirit of God was impressing his heart, but she was not discouraged. She laid her finger upon the text. Presenting in deep humiliation her earnest petitions, her unwavering faith prevailed, and the Lord gave her the desire of her heart. Today, he's just as ready to listen to the prayers, the petitions of his people. For what? In the context, she's talking about prayers for children, right? Testimonies, Volume 5, 322. The Savior is woman's best friend today and is ready to aid her in all the relations of life. What would that be? The relations of life, spouse, children, grandchildren, neighbors, church members, all the relations of life. No work can equal that of the Christian mother. How often we will feel her burdens, we will feel her burdens weight heavier than she can bear. And then how precious the privilege of taking it all to her sympathizing Savior in prayer. Do not expect a change to be wrought in your children without patient, earnest labor. Wrought in your children without patient, earnest labor mingled with fervent prayer. To study and understand their varied characters and day by day to mold them after the divine model is a work demanding great diligence and perseverance and much prayer with an abiding faith in God's promise. That's from Signs of the Times, May 4, 1888. The desire to be a blessing discovers the weakness and inefficiency of the worker. This drives the soul to God in prayer. And the Lord Jesus gives light in his Holy Spirit. And they understand that it is Christ who does the melting and breaking of the hard hearts. Did you catch that? It's not our scolding. It's not our nagging or lecturing. It's Christ who does the melting of the hearts of our children. So besides our friends and our children, who else can we pray for? Well, we mentioned government officials, but we can also pray for the youth of our churches, whether or not we are related to them. Let those older in experience watch over the younger ones. And when they see them tempted, take them aside and pray with them and for them. Messages to Young People, page 18. You know, I've had the opportunity to travel for the white estate in all 13 divisions of the Adventist Church, preaching in 61 countries, sometimes to youth, sometimes to adults. But when I've preached to the youth or spoken to the youth, told stories to the youth, I've often asked them, has anyone other than your parents ever prayed with you one-on-one? -on -one? So did you catch the question? I said to them, has anyone other than your parents ever prayed with you one-on-one? -on -one? And only once in all these places that I've asked this question did a young person raise his hand. So that was really shocking to me, and I think that we need to consider that. You know, are there youth in our churches that we don't even know their names, much less have any kind of rapport with them that would make it strong enough, hi, that would make us have a relationship with them that is strong and tight enough that we could ask them, hey, I'm so glad you came to church today. I'd, I'd like to pray with you. Is there, do you have anything special that, that I can say a prayer with you concerning? And I can tell you that, that those kids that seem so distant and maybe so uninterested and maybe so parking lot-ish or back row-ish, 
um, will still respond if we take an interest in them. And if we do that on a regular basis, the time will come when the Spirit will prompt you to ask them if you could pray for them. Just them, one and one, just you and them. Don't go off in a broom closet in the church, just you know, somewhere in a corner in a public place. Have a prayer. In addition to our youth, we can pray together for other specific persons in our communities. Solicit prayers for the souls for whom you labor. Present them before the church as objects for supplication. It will be just what the church needs to have their minds uh, called from their little petty difficulties to feel a great burden, a personal interest for a soul that's ready to perish. Medical Ministry, page 244. And I thought, you know, that's kind of true. We, we can argue about silly things, you know, the color of the carpet or whatever. Uh, but if we were getting together to pray for specific people in our church that maybe haven't attended for a while, or maybe the youth of our church, certain people, um, it would take our minds, hopefully, off the silly things that we can sometimes fight about. The blessing of the Lord will come to the church members who thus participate in the work, gathering in small groups daily to pray for it for its success. So, you know, we might not be able to pray in person, especially in Canada where your distances are, are pretty great, uh, but we could come together um, on the phone or we could come together for a special weekend of a prayer emphasis. For a while, while my husband and I were attending the Tacoma Southside Seventh-day Adventist Church, the pastor opened the church every morning at five o'clock because the commute in Seattle, as many of you know, is absolutely horrendous. So a lot of people, including myself, would leave um, at five in the morning because I wanted to get all the way up to Bothell from South Tacoma uh, before the heavy traffic set in, when, in which case it would take me three hours to get to work. If I left at five in the morning, I could get there in 59 minutes. And so if I, he, he saw this need and he said, well, those of you who are working, if you would like to stop by the church at five in the morning on your way to work or before you go to work, uh, we could pray together. So I came several times and there were always people there waiting, or not waiting, but praying. And so we just would slip into the little, the little chapel there at our church and pray with whoever was there. It was a really a precious memory that I have. It's good to give some thought to how prayer could be emphasized and practiced more, you know, in your local church as well as the conference and division and worldwide prayer initiatives. We should hold convocations for prayer, asking the Lord to open the way for the truth to enter the strongholds where Satan has set up his throne. What? Are there strongholds right now where Satan has set up his throne? Think about pornography. It, is a, it has a stranglehold on many in our churches. Other addictions where Satan has set up his throne. We have to pray earnestly together that, that God will dispel the shadow that Satan has cast across the pathway of those whom he's seeking to deceive and destroy. Testimonies, volume six, page 80. It's not just gonna happen because Satan claims to be prince of this world. So we gotta get together, we gotta pray where two or three are gathered together, there I will be. Pray in solitude, pray together. Here's a citation that might get you thinking deeply, at least it did for me. At the time when the danger and depression of the church are greatest. I kind of think that the danger of the church is greatest today, at least the greatest I've ever seen in my lifetime. The little company who are standing in the light will be sighing and crying for the abominations that are done in the land. So in our nations, do we see abominations being done? No, no, nothing, nothing, no abominations in Canada? That's good. Glad to hear it. There are abominations in the United States. But more especially will their prayers arise in behalf of the church because its members are doing after the manner of the world. Was it Ezekiel that said that the seal of God will be placed on those who sigh and cry for the abominations done in the land? Thank you. Testimonies, volume five, page 209. And then again, a Bible commentary, Ellen White says in volume three, 1146, we are to come to God in faith and pour out our supplications before him believing that he will work in our behalf 
and in behalf of those we are seeking to save. We are to devote more time in earnest prayer. The special outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God is what we all need, that we all have to have before Jesus comes. It's not going to happen without prayer and lots of it. So imagine a global church, a global chain, praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that it's already happening? And I'm just wondering if you are a part of it. Every morning, seven days a week at 7 a.m. and also at 7 p.m. around the world, people are praying. So if you pray at 7 in the morning in your time zone, there are going to be others in your time zone that are also praying at that time and again at 7 in the evening. And every hour on the hour, there is someone somewhere praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit um, at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. in their time zone. So at our, at our local church, we set a, a call number where any of us could call every morning at 7 and every evening at at seven and different t people took turns you know leading out in that prayer time about 20 minutes and what about praying for the person that annoys you the most or maybe the person in the next pew or the person that gets on your very last nerve too often we forget that our fellow laborers are in need of strength and cheer in times of special perplexity and burden Take care to assure them of your interest and sympathy. While you try to help them by your prayers, let them know that you do it. So if you're praying for somebody at church, let them know that you're praying for them. Maybe you could even do that for a young person before you prayed for them in person. You could say, you know, I've been praying for you. I've been thinking about you. Glad you're here today, and I just want you to know I've been praying for you. That's special to know. When somebody tells me that they've been praying for me, it just warms my heart. Ellen White says, send along the line God's message to his workers. Be strong and of good courage. That's Testimonies, Volume 5, page 322. There's another way that our prayers can be prevented from being answered. It's quite a dramatic story. I want to share it with you. Ellen White had a dream. And in this dream, she saw Dr. John Harvey Kellogg you know him, standing around gossiping with a group of his friends. He was egging them on to say something negative about James White. And when they would say something negative about James White in her dream, Ellen White saw him clap eagerly, yes! And Ellen White wrote, in my dream, I watched Dr. Kellogg go to his room, take out the stones of criticism and gossip he had collected, and add them to a big pile of stones on the floor. Each stone had a name, some piece of juicy gossip and criticism, and every stone was numbered. So I think Dr. Kellogg must have been fairly systematic. And she wrote further, the angel who often accompanied me in vision looked at Dr. Kellogg's pile of stones with sadness and indignation. What are these stones and what are you going to do with them? The angel asked Dr. Kellogg. And Dr. Kellogg looked up with a sharp, cruel laugh. These stones are the mistakes of James White. I'm going to stone him with them. I'm going to stone him to death. And the angel said, you're bringing back the stoning system, are you? The Lord has given you a special work to do. But this is not your work. Put down the stones. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. But Dr. Kellogg seemed very defiant, determined, and he said, Elder White is trying to tear us to pieces. He's working against us, and to save my reputation, I shall use every stone in this pile to kill him. And the angel said, and then what have you gained? By stoning James White, did you right your wrongs? Is Jesus sitting on the throne of your heart? You have a higher calling, a more important work. Leave all such work of gathering stones for the enemies of God's law. Brothers and sisters in the faith, brothers and sisters in the faith must love one another, or you are not children of the day, but you are children of the darkness. And then I saw my husband, James White, out gathering stones 
putting them into a pile, and also getting ready to begin the stoning system. The angel said to my husband, what are you doing? And my husband said, I'm making a big pile of stones to stone Dr. Kellogg. Every time I have a good idea, he opposes me. And the angel said, Elder White, put down those stones. This is not the high and holy work for which God has called you. You have a better, a higher calling. That story really impressed me because I thought, you know, here are these were both extraordinarily gifted individuals. And instead of putting all of their energies into the work of God that needed their help so much, part of their energies were used in building up piles of stones to stone each other. I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 1, verse 10. Now, dear brothers and sisters, I appeal to you by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to stop arguing among yourselves. Let there be real harmony so there won't be divisions in the church. I plead with you to be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. 1 Corinthians 1.10 how intense should we be in this prayer business? How intense was Jesus? He says, I will search for my lost ones who, are, who have strayed away, and I will bring them safely home again. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. Ezekiel 14, 16. Ezekiel 34, 16. And regarding intercessory prayer, Ellen White wrote, I determined that my efforts should never cease until these dear souls through my had such great interest yielded to God. Several entire nights were spent by me in earnest prayer for those whom I had sought out and brought together for the purpose of laboring and praying with them. Testimonies, Volume 133. I want you to listen to parts of a letter that Ellen White wrote to her husband in 1876. She said, Dear husband, last night I visited Edson. Edson was their son. I talked with him plainly but kindly, but his feelings were very strong that he had been wronged. It seems that um, Edson was very talented musically and he'd put together a, a hymnal of some sort, uh, maybe some of them his own original works and a collection of others. And he the, the, the church publishing house published that hymnal, but he didn't think that they gave him his due in terms of royalties. And he was pretty bitter about it. So he, he, was, he had kind of fallen away from even attending church. He was so angry about what he saw as a injustice. So she says, I prayed over Edson, but his heart seemed unbroken. I then decided to spend the night in prayer for our help could come from God alone. I had prayed five times and Edson prayed four. The last time he broke all the pieces. He made an entire surrender to God and such earnest pleadings and entreaties I have seldom heard. He then prayed again and again and seemed to be in agony of spirit, confessing his wrongs, broken in spirit, his tears freely mingled with his prayers. The room seemed to be lighted up with the presence of God. Salvation indeed had come to that house. He then accompanied me home. I didn't sleep much last night and feel worn out this morning, but very thankful that we broke through the cloud of darkness last night and obtained the victory. I was determined not to give up, not to give up the struggle till victory came. I never saw Edson so deeply moved before and so sensible of his danger and weakness. I had spent many hours in prayer to God for Edson before I visited him. Yours with love, Ellen. That's Manuscript Release, Volume 8, page 29. I just love that story, don't you? It's so real. It's so authentic. It's so genuine. It's so, so such a, a, a wonderful picture of how earnest and persevering we should be in praying for our children and others uh, that are on our hearts. When the Spirit of the Lord works upon the hearts of the parents, their prayers and tears will come up before God and they will earnestly entreat. In other words, they will earnestly pray and they will receive grace and wisdom from heaven and will be able to work for their unconverted children. That's in You Shall Receive Power, page 136. 
And Paul reminds us, let us not grow weary while praying. That's doing good, isn't it? For in due season we will reap if we do not lose heart. Galatians 6, 9. Sometimes answers to our prayers come immediately. Sometimes we have to wait patiently and continue earnestly to plead for the things we need. Ellen White wrote that in Healthful Living 240. What happens when we pray? I want you to just picture this. It's so glorious. At the sound of fervent prayer, Satan's whole host trembles. He continues to call legions of his evil angels to accomplish his object. And when angels, all powerful, clothed with the armory of heaven, come to the help of the fainting, pursued soul, Satan and his host fall back. Can you see it? You know, just picture, picture in your mind right now whoever, whoever it is that you're praying for. And imagine the hosts of Satan around them, you know, trying to cause them to stumble, trying to keep their faith from blossoming, trying to get them to do wrong. And you get down beside your bed and you kneel and just picture in your mind while you're kneeling there praying for God to put a hedge of protection about them. What happens? Satan and his host fall back well knowing that their battle is lost. But will he come back to your children? Will he come back to the persons for whom you're praying? Absolutely. So pray again. Be not weary of well-doing. Pray as often as you can. Because what will be the parent's reward? With joy unutterable. Parents see the crown, the robe, the harp given to their children. The days of hope and fear are ended. The seed sown with tears and prayers may have seemed to be sown in vain, but their harvest is reaped with joy at last. Their children have been redeemed. Can you picture it? Can you put your child, the person for whom you're praying, in the arms of Jesus as you look at that picture? That's in Child Guidance 569. And when Christ has won the battle in our hearts and in the hearts of our children and our hearts of our neighbors and our friends, what then? When we've said our last prayer, when we've shed our last tear, what then? There are homes for the pilgrims of earth. I'm reading from Early Writings, page 235. There are robes for the righteous with crowns of glory and palms of victory. All that has perplexed us in the providence of God will in the world to come be made plain. The things hard to be understood will then find explanation. The mysteries of grace will unfold before us where our finite minds saw only confusion and broken promises. We will see the most perfect and beautiful harmony. We will know that infinite love allowed the experiences that seemed most trying as we realize the tender care of him who makes all things work together for good to those who love God, we will rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. That was from Christian Experience and Teachings of Ellen White, page 235. I'm going to share a personal story um, with you tonight, this afternoon. It's coming from this book. A few of you have walked in since I began. It's coming from the book, A Call to Stand Apart. It actually looks like this now. It has a new cover. You can get this book at the Adventist Book Center, and it would be a wonderful thing to give your children, your grandchildren, the young people in your church who are baptized. It's a beautiful, um, easy-to-understand edition of Ellen White's writings. I, my, my, we have three kids. We have our daughter is um, our firstborn, and then uh, we have twin boys. And one of our boys, um, the, both of the boys were baptized, and our daughter. But one of them started kind of um, slipping away as he joined the snowboard culture. It's a pretty secular culture. There are Christian snowboarders, but they're few and far between um, in, the, in the professional world. He was semi-pro. He had his pictures in snowboard magazines, and um, I'll, I'll show you his picture here. Well, not his picture. Yeah, that him. that's him 
one of the posters that he was in, jumping off some cliff. Might have been at Whistler for all I know. Uh, and this is the book that I'm, I'm referencing right now. Um, and I, we, every day I would pray that he would come home spiritually. And one day when he was in his mid-twenties, I'm going to say, um, I had gone for a walk and my, I'd gone out of cell phone range. And when I came back in, I had a call, a message from him, and it said, Mom, call me. Yeah, and you know, moms have this kind of intuition. And so there was a certain urgency in his voice that made me think this was kind of important. So I called my prayer partner, this lovely woman I've been praying with for many years, and I said, you know, my son Mickey called, and he seemed to be really worried about something. He just said, call me. And I just wondered if you'd pray for me before I call him back. And so I called him back, and I said, hey, Mickey, this is Mom. What's up? And he said, um, well... He said, I can't sleep. I mean, I, I can't sleep. And I said, well, what's, what's going on in your life? I had just read Neil Nedley's book, Depression, The Way Out. And so, I, you know, I know that insomnia is sometimes a symptom of depression. So I said, well, what's going on in your life? And he said, well, you know, I'm, I just changed a new job. He was a flight instructor. He said, I just changed to a different company. And um, I, I, I'm taking calculus, I think it was, and and um, chemistry, and you know, they're both pretty heavy subjects, and, and I'm struggling with them, and uh, I just can't sleep. And I said, well, here's some things you can do. And so I mentioned some of the physiological things that Neil Nedley says that you can do when you have insomnia. And he said, thanks, Mom, and hung up. And a couple days later, he called again. And this time, his voice was just ragged, just ragged with despair. I was scared to hear his voice. I'd never heard his voice sound like that. And he said, Mom, I still can't sleep. I mean, I'm not sleeping at all. And I'm flying airplanes with a passenger. And I'm afraid we're going to crash. And I said, Mickey, do you think this is a spiritual battle? And just like that, he said, yes. And I said, do you remember... Um, a few months ago, I sent you a book called A Call to Stand Apart. I, I sent it to you in the mail. And I described it to him, and he said, yeah, I remember it. And I said, do you still have it? Now, that was a very relevant question. Because in Portland, Oregon, there's a, a bookstore called Powell's. And you can sell books there by the pound. So my boys would say, they would take my books that I mailed to them, and they would call them mom's propaganda packages. And they would take them to Powell's and sell them. So this one probably wouldn't have been worth very much because it's pretty light. So I, he, I said, do you remember that book? And he said, yes. And I said, do you still have it? And he said, yeah, I do. I still have it. I just saw it on my shelf. And I said, well, why don't, when, I, when we hang up, why don't you read chapter four? I said, it's just short. And we hung up. I'm going to share this with you. It's not a long chapter, just a couple pages. This is the story of a young man weary of the restraints of living at home. Things came to the point that he decided he had to get away. His wealthy, loving father gave the lad his inheritance, and he left for a place he thought he would have freedom to do whatever he pleased. He had the money to satisfy every desire. Because money attracts company, he soon had a group of friends to help him spend his wealth in high living. But the hopes and dreams he had nurtured while a boy at home soon sank into oblivion, along with the stability and security of his spiritual upbringing. His inheritance squandered, he applied for a job and was assigned to look after hogs. For a Jew, nothing could have been worse. Jesus' Jewish audience understood the pits of degradation and humiliation he was describing. The young man, determined to find liberty, instead found himself a virtual slave. Friendless, starving, sick at heart, he forced himself to eat hog's food to survive. In this narrative, we see an amazing picture of the hopelessness of a life divorced from God. It may take time for us to realize how poverty-stricken we are when we separate ourselves from the love of the Heavenly Father, 
But that day will come. All the while, God is desperately seeking to find ways to influence us to return home. The young man ultimately came to his senses, realizing that the servants in his father's house were better off than he was. In his misery, the boy remembered his father's love. And the memories of that love began to beckon him home. What memories are you leaving your children and grandchildren that would beckon them home if they should stray? Finally, he made the decision to head back and to confess his waywardness. He decides he will tell his father, I've sinned against heaven and you. I'm not worthy to be called your son, but let me be like one of your employees. Weak from hunger in a land of famine with only rags left for clothes, he finally left the pig pens and set out for the place he grew up as a child. The runaway had no conception of the sadness that had overwhelmed his father and his mother when he left. He never dreamed of the shadow that came over the whole house when reports filtered back of his wild partying. And no one could have convinced him that every day his father sat watching, waiting for his son's return. Yet now, with weary and painful steps, he turned eagerly toward home to beg for a servant's position. While still a considerable distance from the house, the father recognized his son and ran to meet him, hugging him in a long, clinging, emotional embrace. You don't believe that Ellen White says that? It's footnoted. Look it up. Oh, she says it in a little bit more 19th century words, but it's the same. To protect his son from being observed in such a destitute condition, the father took off his own beautiful coat and placed it around the boy's shoulders. Overcome by such a loving reception, the young man began to sob his repentant speech. But the father would have none of it. He had no place in his household for a servant's son. His lad must have the very best the house could provide. The father told his servants to bring the finest clothes and a ring for his hand, to find fine shoes for his feet and prepare a feast so everyone could celebrate. And there would be a theme at this celebration. The dead son is alive. The lost son has been found. What a vastly different perception this boy now had of his father. He had always thought of him as rather stern and severe. But no longer. In his great need, he saw the true character of his father which is what this story is all about. In our rebellion, we often think of God as stern and severe, demanding in his requirements. But when you've been away a long time and are spiritually hungry, dressed in the rags of sin and guilt, then you will see how fully loving and accepting the Heavenly Father really is. When you take even one step Toward your father in repentance. He will run to wrap you in his arms of love. He will forgive your sins and never remember them again. So don't wait or try to clean yourself up so you can be good enough to come to Jesus. If we waited to be good enough, we would never come. Jesus is waiting for you calling you, yearning for you, and all heaven will celebrate when you come home. The next day, Mickey called me, and he said, Mom, I read that chapter, and I've been thinking. Bar hopping is not really making me happy. The happiest I've ever been was when I was a counselor at Glacier View Ranch, working for Ron Whitehead, helping kids know Jesus. That's the happiest I've ever been. And I want to find that happiness again, so I accepted Jesus again last night. About a week later, I came to visit him in his home. The pictures on his wall were different. The music he was playing was different. The food in his refrigerator was different. And when he invited me to study the Sabbath school lesson with him, I nearly lost my teeth.
But that's not the end of the story. I want to tell you one more segment of that story, and I'm sure there will be more segments the closer we come to Jesus' return. But this segment has to do with you. This year is the NAD's National Teachers Convention. I forget where it's going to be this year, but... Okay, back in the day, I used to go when I worked for the White Estate. I still work for the White Estate, but remotely. So when I was working in the office full-time, I used to go to these. And I made a presentation about prayer and our kids, kind of similar to what I did today, but also uh, mixed in with what I'm going to present to you tomorrow. Um, about youth and their involvement in the church, which some, I'm going to tell you some things that might startle you. Um, and I told this story about Mickey, and I also told the ending of how he came to Jesus, as I just told you. And afterwards, this lady came up to me, and her eyes were kind of misty, and she looked kind of vaguely familiar to me, but I didn't know her name or I couldn't place where I had seen her before. And she said, you came to the Idaho conference three or four years ago, and you gave us a presentation on prayer, and you asked us to pray for your son, Mickey, because when you told us the story in Idaho, he hadn't given his heart to Jesus yet. And she said, I just want you to know that I have prayed for him every day for the last four years. I was incredulous. The gratitude from inside my heart is just overwhelming. That a woman who I didn't even know had taken the challenge, the invitation I had given to pray for my son, Mickey, for four years every day. To be aware of new videos like this one, be sure to subscribe to the Preparing for the Time of Trouble channel. For more free videos and downloadable audio podcasts, as well as handouts, go to www.preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com. Topic categories include recordings of live seminar presentations, country living, sustainable gardening, homestead remedies, how to be self-sufficient when the grid goes down, wild edible and medicinal plants, hydrotherapy, and end-time Bible prophecies. To take advantage of these free resources, go to preparingforthetimeoftrouble.com.